Welcome back, everyone. Let's begin by looking at some verses that, for Muslims, justify their belief that Abraham and Ishmael built the Kaaba in modern-day Mecca. Abraham raised up the foundations of the house and Ishmael with him, and Surah 5 tells us that the house is the Kaaba. Also, the first house was laid down at Becca, according to Surah 396, which numerous translations, like Sahih International, conveniently change to refer to Mecca. There are a couple of problems with Surah 2.127 in Arabic, and there is absolutely no justification in the Quran for taking Becca as another name for modern Mecca. But we'll set that aside for now and simply assume the traditional Muslim narrative. Now, let's ask, have these stories about Abraham in the Quran been influenced by a prior source? To answer that question, we're going to look at pre-Quranic Syriac sources. Why Syriac? There are a couple of reasons. First, there is correspondence between Syriac vocabulary and the Quran at the word level, including the word Quran itself. Theodore Noldecki states, The term Quran is not just an exclusively Arabic development from an infinitive of the same meaning, but is rather a borrowing from Syriac. Arthur Jeffrey, in his work on the foreign vocabulary of the Quran, agrees, and their thesis has stood the test of time. More recently, Fred Donner states, Almost everyone who discusses the Quran notes that the very word Quran is derived from Syriac. But this is nothing new. The Quran text contains words that are indubitably of Syriac origin, but this fact has been recognized for years, centuries, actually. And according to Andrew Rippon, starting in the early centuries of Islam, Muslim exegetes frequently discussed various words which they consider to be of Syriac origin. The basic thrust is the same as the one for Luxembourg and Mingana. If the text is problematic, then perhaps Syriac can solve the issue. Medieval Muslims took a similar basic approach. And Sidney Griffith agrees, Quran scholars, in search of the origins of what they sometimes present as the foreign vocabulary of the Quran, have not infrequently called attention to what they consider to be the high incidence of Syriac loanwords and cognates in the Arabic idiom of the Islamic scripture. Second, similarities aren't just at the word level. They're larger than that. They're at the narrative level as well. In comparing the legend of Alexander between the Quran and Syriac sources, Kevin Van Bladel says many of the correspondences between the Syriac and the Arabic stories are so obvious that they do not need special attention. Simply relating both stories together establishes their extraordinary similarity. More generally, Sidney Griffith adds, it is something of a truism among scholars of Syriac to say that the more deeply one is familiar with the works of the major writers of the classical period, the more one hears echoes of many of their standard themes and characteristic turns of phrase at various points in the discourse of the Arabic Quran. Why Syriac? That's why. Joseph Whitstam did his PhD dissertation at Princeton in 2011 and discussed in great detail the Syriac influence on the Quran, so we'll draw from that here. I know Muslims just love Princeton scholars like Bart Ehrman, so I thought this would be a good choice. First, Whitstam points out that in Genesis 22, it's Abraham who does all of the work. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar. However, in later traditions, Isaac becomes active as well. Josephus writes about Isaac who was setting up the altar, eagerly heaping up the stones to build his tomb. And there are several Syriac homilies along these lines. These are all pre-Quranic and also describe Isaac as an active participant in the building. But the most important Syriac source to consider is Jacob of Sarog, and that's because the Quran borrows from him elsewhere. Let's look at a couple of those examples first. Sir 18, 9 through 26 is the well-known Seven Sleepers story. About this, Sidney Griffith says the earliest Syriac texts, which feature the story of the youths of Ephesus as the companions of the cave or Seven Sleepers are always called in Syriac, are two recensions of a liturgical homily attributed to Jacob of Sarog, who spent most of his life as a monk composing homilies on biblical and other liturgical themes. Griffith then goes on to describe how the Quran adapted this material for its own use. Now, back to Whitstam, who also suggests some more barred material in the Quran from Jacob of Sarog. The Quran states, Sons of Adam do not let Satan tempt you, as he drove your parents out of the garden, stripping both of them of their clothing in order to show both of them their shameful parts. Jacob of Sarog also describes how during creation, Satan, in a very close parallel with the Quran, destroyed the beauty of their garments and made them stand naked. 
you can see the similarities to Surah 727. Thus, we have good reason to look at pre-Quranic Syriac material, and definitely good reason to look at Jacob of Sarog. The source most relevant to our issue of Abraham in the House is a Syriac verse homily by Jacob of Sarog, dedicated to Genesis 22. For our needs, a few lines will suffice. Jacob describes extending the foundation and Isaac building as well. Now, there are two phrases, one in Arabic and one in Syriac, which bear a remarkable resemblance when the best translations are attempted. Both speak about raising or extending the foundations of the house. But the Quran frequently borrows from more than one source. In Genesis 22, there's no prayer from Abraham after the test, but in rabbinic tradition, there is. In Genesis Rabbah, a prayer is put in Abraham's mouth. Lord of the universe, when you told me, take your son, your only son Isaac, etc. And we see a prayer from Abraham in the Quran as well. And when Abraham raised the foundations of the house in Ishmael with him, our Lord, accept this from us, surely you, you are the hearing, the knowing. And the prayer continues. Now, Whitstam makes a very important observation. That such parallels exist between the sacrifice story of Genesis 22 and the Quranic scene describing the building of the Kaaba is not surprising if we take into account the similar ideological function of the two texts. The scene in the Quran serves to explain the origin of worship at the Kaaba. Genesis 22 probably also serves as an ideology for worship at the temple in Jerusalem, and at the very least was understood in this fashion in later Jewish tradition. Therefore, the scene in the Quran may be understood as an appropriation of the foundation story of the Jerusalem temple adapted to the founding of the Kaaba. This would not be the first time that the site in which the attempted sacrifice took place was identified with a sacred site of another religion. And in yet another case of Islamicizing, the Quran changes Isaac to Ishmael. The replacement of Isaac with Ishmael is another striking innovation and is most probably related to the notion that the Arabs are the descendants of Ishmael. Islam is not a religion that has any basis in history. Rather, it's a religion that rewrites history to provide its own basis. As another example, notice how Abraham apparently has knowledge of Muhammad. Our Lord raise up among them a messenger from among them to recite your signs to them and to teach them the book and the wisdom and to purify them. The description mentioned in Abraham's request matches the description of the messenger, taken by Muslims, of course, to be Muhammad. Just as Abraham said, the messenger recites, purifies, and teaches. So proto-Muslims, in attempting to make their faith appear Abrahamic, adapted pre-Islamic traditions to describe how the Kaaba was built by Abraham in Becca, according to the Quran. But then Becca is transferred post hoc to modern-day Mecca. Now is a good time to say that the traditional Muslim account about modern Mecca being the mother of all cities, the center of trade, the place where Muhammad eradicated paganism and instituted monotheism, is all garbage. Let's start with the latter. What evidence of pre-Islamic paganism do we have in the Hejaz region? The considerable archaeological activity of the past several decades has failed to find any evidence for a pagan cult in the Hejaz, such as is described in the Muslim sources, whereas a cult very similar to those descriptions did exist in the Negev. And again, there have been extensive surveys of the Hejaz and northern Arabian Peninsula by teams of Arab and Western archaeologists over the last few decades. They have found no evidence to corroborate the traditional account, even though they were expressly looking for it. They did indeed find sites from other periods, but no 6th or 7th century sites have been found, which accord even partially with the descriptions of the Jahli Hejaz in the Muslim sources. And one more time. Over the last few decades, teams of local and Western archaeologists have carried out large-scale, systematic archaeological surveys and excavations in the Hejaz, the peninsula, and the Jordanian desert. Their findings are regularly published in the archaeological literature, but the results are very different from those we might have expected. The finds include no remains of local Arab cultures from the 6th and early 7th centuries, and no pagan sanctuaries, such as those described in the Muslim sources. An ever-expanding body of evidence now warrants acknowledging the start of Islam was much farther north than modern Mecca, even as geographical references in the Quran and Hadith affirm, though the latter does so unwittingly. It is well known that modern Mecca had no pre-Islamic religious importance, and the first mention of what we know as modern Mecca is over a century 
after the traditional date of Muhammad's death. If modern-day Mecca was a pre-Islamic religious hub and a center of trade, nobody noticed, and not a hint of it was left behind for archaeologists to discover. History does, however, tell of an Arabian metropolis. Josephus describes the Hebrews wandering in the wilderness and through Arabia, and came to a place which the Arabians esteemed their metropolis, called Petra. As mentioned earlier, we do get a geographical clue for the house in the Quran. Surely the first house laid down for the people was that at Becca. Now we are left to assume that this is the same house in Surah 2, however Surah 14 complicates things. There, the house appears to already be standing. Abraham said, Our Lord, I have settled some of my descendants near your sacred house. But we'll just assume that it's the same one that Abraham and Isaac, I mean Ishmael, built. Now, about the term Becca, it can mean weeping or mourning. Gabriel Reynolds has suggested that Surah 396 refers to Psalm 84. Psalm 84.6 mentions the Valley of Baca, and Surah 396 talks about Becca. Some commentators have suggested that the location in Psalm 84.6 is metaphorical. The Baca Valley is not a localizable valley near Jerusalem or anywhere else in Israel, but a metaphor for Valley of Drought or Valley of Death. As far as the geography is concerned, I do believe that the general concept is more important to keep in mind here because the context of Psalm 84 is a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. An entry from Erdman's Dictionary of the Bible states, about the Valley of Baca, this valley of unknown identification apparently was an arid region through which pilgrims passed en route to Jerusalem. Whether literal or metaphorical, Psalm 84 directs us to the area of Jerusalem. The Quran then, if this is an allusion to Psalm 84, once again is orienting our thinking much further north than modern-day Mecca. In doing so, the Quran would be in line with a number of other pre-Quranic sources, which connect the incident of Abraham, Isaac, and the altar to Jerusalem, or the near vicinity. Reynolds states, The Abrahamic traditions in Mecca may also have some connections with Hebron, where by tradition the divine visitation to Abraham in Genesis 18 took place. This festival, not unlike the later Islamic pilgrimage, involved prayers, a well, animal sacrifices, offerings, abstaining from sexual relations, and sleeping in tents. It is possible that the celebration of the Abrahamic pilgrimage at this spot near Hebron was eventually transferred to Mecca. F. E. Peters said it well. The Quran mentions that the first house was established for mankind at Baca, which left the medieval commentators little choice but to identify Baca with Mecca, though no one was quite sure why. So far we've seen that the Quran Islamicized prior stories about Abraham found in biblical, rabbinic, and Syriac sources. This was done to establish an Abrahamic connection to the Kaaba, but it is obvious that cobbling together elements from several stories and changing details as necessary to suit Islamic sensibilities does not result in a legitimate, truthful, historical basis for religion. So when the Quran describes those who go around it, and the ones who are devoted to it, and the ones who bow, and the ones who prostrate themselves, what is this verse describing? It does sound similar to the modern Hajj ritual, of course. However, these similarities also have pre-Islamic pagan precursors. Though, as we've discussed, the pagan cult center was not modern Mecca. An extensive survey carried out in 1985 provided evidence that a local Arab tradition of worshipping stones continued without interruption in the Negev from at least the 1st century BCE to the 8th century CE. Some of the cult shrines had a raised threshold, and from the walls protruded stones, which were worn smooth and shiny from being touched. Yehuda Nevo described Abrahamism as a generic form of monotheism, which emphasizes Abraham's role as the founder and model of religion. This was a belief embraced by Arabs in various forms and was a precursor to what ultimately became Islam. Yudhanivo, coming from a completely different perspective, comes to the same conclusion as Joseph Whitstam that we heard from earlier. The new Arab religion that arose in the 7th century borrowed from Abrahamism. For instance, the Kaaba, a pagan sanctuary, was incorporated into the new religion via a tradition linking it with Abraham. Nor did Arab pagan activity die out after Muhammad, as the Muslim sources say. Pagans must have formed a considerable part of the population all through the first two centuries of the Muslim era, for the pagan cult reemerges in a pagan revival which took place, so it seems, under Hisham, when scores of new pagan cult centers 
were built in the central Negev. Anyone who looks at Muslims trampling over each other trying to touch and kiss a rock can see that paganism is alive and well in the Muslim world today. Now, before we finish, let's look at one argument that Muslims try to use from the Bible to support their traditional geography. Ishmael is mentioned in the wilderness of Paran in Genesis 21. Any guess where Muslims want to claim Paran is? Let's look at Islam Q&A. Although many passages in the Torah suggest that Paran is in Palestine, some imam says it is Mecca, according to the consensus of the people of the book. Even though the Torah suggests that Paran is in Palestine, according to this imam, the consensus of the people of the book is that it's not. And another demonstrable lie, there is no difference of opinion between the Muslims and the people of the book concerning the fact that Paran is Mecca. If we only had some scholarly resources to consult on the location of Paran. Oh wait, we do. Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament situated between Midian and Egypt and to be identified with the Sinai Peninsula. Not located with certainty, but the name is preserved 80 kilometers west of Petra. Dictionary of Classical Hebrew, Paran is the wilderness area west of Edom and north of Sinai, home of Ishmael. And once again, we're pointed west of Petra. Dictionary of Biblical Languages. Paran is a desert area in the Sinai Peninsula. But what did we hear earlier? Paran is Mecca, according to the consensus of the people of the book. Paran is not in Mecca, according to the book, the people of the book, or any consensus other than the consensus, of course, of some Muslims who are determined to support their worldview with non-existent evidence they themselves impose artificially and dishonestly on their cherry-picked sources. Paran is actually much farther north, in the general vicinity of what many now consider to be the original holy city of Islam, Petra. The Quran certainly points in that direction itself. It does this with its geography and terminology. Let's look at the latter. We sent the book down so that you may warn the mother of towns. This coheres with Petra specifically. The Petra scrolls attest to the name mother of colonies for Petra. It was probably also Elabagalus who bestowed the title mother of colonies upon Petra. In addition to the numerous geographical references in the Quran and its terminology, the script itself points us north. The evidence shows that the pronunciation of Quranic Arabic at the time of its initial composition aligns with the Arabic of the southern Levant. What we can be quite sure about is that clear Arabic, in which the Quran was first recited, was not the native dialect of Mecca. When we ask about the geographical origins of Islam, so much diverse evidence points us far north of modern-day Mecca. So let's summarize. Did Abraham build the Kaaba? Not a chance. Was Abraham ever in Mecca? Not a chance. Not many people were, at least until about the 8th century. Thanks for watching.